Hi guys, welcome to Learning Electronics Repair. If you're regular viewers, you'll know we've had these PCBs before. These are off the air hockey machines that you find in the amusement arcades. And previously I had, I think, four of these, one good one and three bad ones. I tried to repair a couple of them, but the problem seems to be that these tracks effectively get corroded and rotted i had one that was very bad i tried to repair a lot of tracks and it still didn't work so this one i made some comparisons with the working one while it was here but i no longer have the working one and you can see that a lot of these components here go to this chip you can see where the tracks from under here this is actually not an eprom exactly which i thought it was this contains the sound samples for the game, so you get like the cheering noise when you score a goal and that sort of thing. And I actually measured from all the data and address lines on here to see where they go. And I was measuring the resistance to ground from each one and comparing them with a good one. And this one, the resistance values are not the same as a good one. If you look, all these tracks that come from here either go to the processor which is this or they go to one of these chips and these are latches so these latch in data for example when you set the switch settings they read the data in and the processor can read the value of the switches but it doesn't actually read the switch it just reads the data that's held on one of these it effectively this chip reads it once and then that data is held for the processor. So that's what a latch does, and that's what these are. And some of them go to this chip as well. So what I'm going to do with this, as, if you like, a, a final attempt to fix it, I know that there's an issue with resistances to ground, measuring from here, compared with a good one. So I've ordered a bag full of these chips. They were quite easy to get and cheap. I'm going to unsolder all of these and I think I'll take the processor off as well. And then I'm going to actually look to see where all these tracks are going. This is a double sided board, so somewhere on the back. But I'm going to check to see from one end to the other of the tracks, can I find any open circuits caused by corroded tracks. And just before I do remove these, I actually just zoom down. You can have a, a look at what we have here. Now I've zoomed down a little bit, you can see corrosion on these tracks of this board around this area. Some of these vias which go through to the other side may be corroded. I mean, these look a bit bad, okay? And you can see more around here. Hopefully once I remove these chips, it will be easy to see where these tracks go underneath. And then just methodically, I'm just going to effectively go all the way around this part of the board, just checking continuity on all the tracks. If they all look okay, fine. If they don't, I'll repair the ones that don't. This I'll have to put back on because this holds some custom code in there. There's no way to really know if it's good or bad. I'll just have to trust it is good. And then these, I'll just change them all. These are connected to the outside world, if you like, down through here. So if something has been damaged, it's likely to be one of these. We can probably check all these opto isolators, at least just to see that they read the same as each other. And these switches are prone to failure as well. Because I want to use hot air to remove this lot, I'm actually going to unsolder these first. And while they're off the board, I may as well test them. These will be easiest to unsolder with the vacuum desoldering tool. And then we can get onto all the rest of them with hot air. I think I'll take this capacitor out as well. There's nothing else really close by here that I need to worry about. Maybe that one. Okay, so the first step, I'm actually going to unsolder these. I'm sure you can hear the vacuum tool warming up. While that's warming up, we'll add some leaded solder to these. A little bit of flux, not too much because it tends to clog the desoldering tool but a little bit probably won't hurt. These things next to them are pull-up resistors. So effectively you'll have eight or 10 resistors in each package, 
one end will be probably a power rail and then the other end is the resistor so once these switches are off again i can also check all these so we can see if we have any problem with those we may as well do it while we're working in this area because it's easy to do at that time basically okay so that's just warming up it's getting there let's just add some leaded solder I won't worry too much if they bridge together because they were coming off anyway. This is actually working quite well. This board may well be using leaded solder anyway. They come out old boards. So I'm thinking these should come off quite easily. Let's see. Just give that a quick clean and we'll go again the other side. Actually you will notice that with this sort of work it does often involve an element of luck. But you will also find the more you practice the luckier you will get. Yeah, <laughs> that's a very true statement. The more you practice the luckier you get. Okay, last one. There we go. Always give the clean before you put it on one side. And it shouldn't clog up. Right. Let's see. <laughs> that will look here. <laughs> Focus. Uh, the luckier you get. Uh, there we go so we have those off the board now we can see there are some tracks under here once we've removed these chips we can then easily test these resistor networks what else do we want to take off here the stuff that's going to melt easily this plastic thing this this and maybe this one okay You can see my look ran out on that one. The pad came off. But it's not soldered this side. It may cause a problem trying to resolder it to the other side. But it looks like this is just used to attach some sort of diagnostic device or something. Maybe a J tag or something. It's not used when the machine is actually running so I'm not too worried about that fortunately doesn't quite easily want to come out Yep, it fell out. If they don't want to come, don't pull them. You'll probably take the traps with them if you're not lucky. So which is the one that we damaged? Was it that one? Yeah, it was that one. I wonder if that happened because, as you can see, this is already rotted away anyway. I think that may well be why that came off rather than just me yeah <laughs> yeah looks like a good excuse anyway 
Comments below, guys. Yeah. Comments below. Okay, so just the two capacitors. I'm not actually going to try and take that off. I really don't need to. And then let's remove these chips. Okay, sorry if it's a bit out of focus, guys. It's because I'm focused at the other end of the board, the lower level, basically. This one. I could manually focus it, but you could just forgive me for a moment. Okay. Okay. I don't think we need that anymore. So it's nice and quiet again. Okay. While we're here then, let's just check the few things that we've removed. So we'll just check these switches first. Easy to do. They're either in the on or the off position. I know from the video previously what the settings were, which one came from where and how they set, so I can mess around with them. But otherwise you need to take photos, okay? So this one should all be set to off. I doubt any of them are actually stuck in the on position, but yeah, we may as well check while we're here, yeah? I think if I just connect to one end, all of them, I can quickly see if there's a connection through to there, yeah. Rather than checking them all individually, they should all be off at the moment. Okay. That's okay. Same with this one. You could check them all individually if you want. I'll just do a few, then come down a little bit, do a few. Come down to the bottom. Yeah. Meter's working. So this one pins one, two, seven are off, all the rest are on. Okay. One is off. Two is off, that is should all be on. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven is off. Bent it. No, just bent it. Tied a little bit, I haven't really bent it. Seven off, eight should be on. Okay, so they all read okay. I'm not gonna bother switching them because that's how they are in the uni, yeah. I doubt these ever get changed, so I'm happy with that. But yes, you could switch them all over and check the connections. I think I have a good enough reason not to. Okay, so let's take these off. I don't think I'll melt that switch, but to be honest, I've got them. If I do, it's not really a problem. All these chips are the same type. Okay. 74HC573A. Okay. So they were all identical, but they're not all the same way round. Yeah, you can see they're not all the same way round. So... We need to either take a photo or in some other way make a mark so we know which way round they go. I'm not sure they marked on the board. Yeah, I think they are actually marked. I think it's like a little notch. Let's take one of them off and then let's have a look to see if there is some marking. It looks like there probably is. This little thing, by the way, looks like a capacitor with three legs as a ceramic resonator. That's a bit like a crystal, crystal oscillator, but cheaper and probably not quite so stable, but probably pretty stable. Not that it's that important, I thought I would just mention it. In case you've not seen one or you have seen one and wondered why you get capacitors with three legs on them, yeah. And they're not necessarily made in the Isle of Man, I will just mention. <laughs> You'll have to look that one up, guys, if you didn't get it. So we'll add some flux. People talk so much about using low melt solder to do this sort of work and why I don't. I have some, but personally I find that leaded solder really does a good job of this, yeah. 
had some leaded solder. But for those of you who use low melt solder, yeah, no reason why not to. There are many different techniques for doing this sort of work, and really, I think when you learn a technique that suits you, use it. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the same one as me, and my technique doesn't have to be the same one as yours. Okay, but no harm in mentioning it. Yeah, let's just you know, this is a, a discussion place, so let's all talk about the ways we like to do things. Okay, so that one has some leaded solder on. Let's unsolder it. I'm thinking now the easiest way to go with it is probably towards this heat sink. It might be better to remove that actually, but I think because there's no heavy ground planes in this board that I can see, it should come off quite easily. Let's have a go. Another thing somebody mentioned, that actually a good question, so let's chat as well, is if you're working on this sort of thing where the PCB is quite valuable or even irreplaceable, is what happens if you damage it, yeah, and make it worse. And the only answer to that really is that sometimes things will happen, yeah, stuff happens sometimes. So what you need to do is make an agreement, preferably on paper and signed with your client, that while you will take all due care and attention, things may get damaged or broken. And that's just the nature of it. If they're not willing to accept that, then really you should not be willing to accept the job, yeah. Now let's unsolder this chip with some due care and attention, yeah? I'm on 450 degrees on the hot air, 120 airflow, which is the maximum airflow for this. Let's see if we can get this thing to come off. Okay, now we can see in actual fact that pin one is marked, so let's just proceed and remove the other ones as well. Okay, they came easily. While it's still warm, let's lift the processor off as well. Again, just make some note of which way round it goes. I don't see any particular markings, but we can see where the label is. Okay, and then lastly, let's just clean up the uh, board, yeah, just clean up the board. Probably a bit more flux there will help actually. A bit of braid. You see, I'm not dragging this across the pins, I'm just pushing down on it. You can also see that this sort of work isn't that time consuming. 
So although it maybe seems a daunting task or the long way round, the chances are with this, it's actually the short way round. And the most likely way to be successful Now I'm putting a bit more flux on. When the board is cooling down a little bit now, so it will be more harder to do this. If you're struggling, just warm it up as well with the hot air, just warm it back up a bit. Okay. Let's get some isopropyl alcohol and clean it up. Another thing somebody asked recently is, what's this stuff? So this is what I use for cleaning the PCBs, okay? Isopropyl alcohol, 99.9%. I usually put a small amount in this, just the bottom of a plastic water bottle. Screw the lid back on that before it gets knocked over. And then this will become contaminated during the use, but it's not gonna go back in the bottle. But I'll show you what I do do with it, yeah? So what I do with it, you see I haven't finished yet, but that is becoming contaminated. I have this little bottle, and this is the contaminated stuff. So I'll just top this up into here. And I then use this again. So normally for a PCB like this, I will use the contaminated stuff. And then once I've cleaned the worst of it off, I will just dry with the kitchen roll and then use clean stuff to finish. Yeah. So doing this way, you get another use out of it. And it's fine to use the contaminated stuff first and then the clean stuff, smaller amounts of it second. And what you do use of the clean stuff goes back into here anyway. It's not expensive stuff, but it's a bit hard to get here on Grand Canaria. In fact, the only way I can actually get it is go over to the UK, bring it back with me. Or Sometimes people who are going over to the mainland on the ferry will bring it back with them. Can't post it, not to here anyway. And the electronics shops in the capital last time I asked didn't have any. Okay. It's also expensive to get here. Somebody did get me some, it was like 25 euros for a litre. And then last time I went to the UK in January, I got a litre of it for about eight euros and brought it back with me, yeah, seven pounds. Okay, there we go. So that is clean. And then if we like, we can just take a bit of the fresh stuff and just give it a final clean over. And then this will end up back in the contaminated stuff. There we are. To do this, I think now we've got this far, you will see it's much easier to see this board now with those components removed. And I'm also going to remove these two as well. This one isn't actually used, thinking about it, so actually I'm not really particularly concerned about that one, but some of the tracks do come to this chip. So I think it's worth removing both of these sockets, and then we can have a really good look at this PCB. And to be honest, it's not a big job to do it either. You may comment below that you can clearly see where the tracks are going here anyway, but I would just remind you of that that we found here. Yeah. So I think that's a good reason to actually remove these. Okay, so hopefully these will also just come out of the board. Let's have a look. That was a little bit stuck. Yeah, uh, it is coming in. I didn't have to put any pressure on this. Out it came. This one the same.
Yeah. Yeah. So no pressure on that out the game. And now we can see this much easier. It's much better to do this, I think. You can see this desoldered perfectly well. And I would say because there was no corrosion, like there was with the one I keep banging on about that one, yeah. Uh, so that's that done. And there's the result, guys. So we can clearly now see where the tracks go to on this IC, yeah. And I hope you agree with me that although it took a little bit of time, maybe 30 minutes, maybe less actually, that's much easier to work on now. We can see around it, we can see what we got, yeah. That's to me is the way to do this. Again, comments below guys, but that to me is the way to do this. So what we can do is now, we'll just check these pull up resistors while it's easy to make sure they're okay. And then we'll get onto the various tracks and see if we can find any problems there with corroded and broken tracks, basically. Testing these resistors really is quite easy. I have the meter on ohms range, and you can see we have one common pin. And then on this one, eight pins, okay. One common, I think this one actually has six, yeah. And then one common pin, eight again. So, if we just go on resistance range as I am, and we get it from the common pin, so each of the other pins should read the same resistance. Yeah, it looks like this is probably a 4.7K. And we should find the same on each of them. Okay, let's go to the next one, the smaller one, the same value. Yeah. So, you can see guys, these are easy to test. It's that one and the last one, which is here. Those are good, and there's a the one on the other side as well. Now this one is not quite so obvious, which is the common pin, but it's probably the one with the square part there. I think that's the best indication, let's have a look. Yeah. If you get the wrong one, you'll find the first measures nine. Nine, in fact they're all reading the same, and that's because you're actually reading through one resistor to the common and back again, yeah? And you may think they're actually 10K resistors. Yeah, until you get to the last one and it reads 4.7 so that's when you know you got it wrong so from here as we were just doing and they're all good because this is a double sided board we could effectively check the tracks on its side, but then we'd have to check the wires going through to the other side as well. So I think the easy way is to put this on something that lights up behind it. I have something that I use, which I'll show you guys. You've seen it before, I think. And then we can see through the board because there's no power planes in this. And we can see where the tracks go and we can start to check them all. Okay. And we have it nice and bright there. And as I said, we can actually see the traces on the other side of the board. So this should help us really in figuring out how this is wired up. This is the time consuming bit. It's nothing clever. It's just literally a matter of finding each trace one at a time. And just seeing that we have continuity. So we can, for example, just start over here somewhere. We'll go with this one, which comes from this resistor. And we can see that it actually goes to here before it disappears through the board. And we should have continuity. Put the bleeper on, that's probably the best thing to do. Okay. So we now have a good connection to there. And then we need to see if we can actually see through the board where that's going. Looks like it's going down this way. If it's not clear, just turn it over and have a look. And we just need to check all of these tracks now. 
I think the best way to go about this is to put some sort of marker pen on the ones that you've done so you know you've done them. And don't forget to go to the halfway point. So, for example, this one also goes to here. Okay. I expect this might take you an hour, but I can't think of any better way to do this, to be quite honest. So, I will just get on with it. And any that I find that are suspicious, I will let you guys know. You can also see, by the way, that there are some tracks under here. And it just so happens that the first one I was looking at which goes to here i have the lighting switched off at the moment by the way just goes to here and then that actually comes down to here and to this part so that wouldn't be easy to trace at all without that missing so we can say that one's done i think probably just put a colored dot on one end of it when we've actually completed it maybe put a dot on all the points it goes to so we know it's been dealt with. Yeah. And then we just keep going. Right guys, I used a slightly different approach in the end. So I tracked every visible track on this side from one end to the other, to all the vias or anything it went to and made sure everything was okay. Then I flicked this over and did the same on this side. This isn't really corroded anyway. And then lastly, I checked every single via that I can see going through from one side to the other, especially these dirty looking ones. And they're all okay. I can't find any problems here. Even these tracks which go up here, they look bad, but in actual fact, put something under it in the moment, the other eyes. Not quite as bright as the other one was. Yeah, so even like these tracks that go up here, they look bad, but we can trace them through and we find they're actually okay, yeah. So everything checks out all right on this board. I'm down to the fact that I was reading different resistances from the pins on these chips to ground, and they all basically connect to this lot, all the CPU. So I'm now going to fit the stuff back on. I'm going to replace these. I could try and clean this up, but I'm not sure it would actually help. Everything I have continuity is possible. I just may make it worse, actually. I'm sure one or two of you guys will have something to say about that. But I'll put all this stuff back on. I'll replace all these. We'll fit that one back on. And then we'll let the guy try it again and see what happens this time. So guys, Sod's Law has got me, or Murphy's Law. These are the HC573 that I removed. These are the ones that I bought just a pack of 20 of. They were cheap and they were also the wrong package, although they're the right part number. So I can't use these to replace these. So does that mean we can do anything other than ordering some of the right ones? Well, yeah, we can do some things, one of them now and one possibly later. So a few weeks ago, I actually ordered something which I'm just going to show to you guys. I ordered one of these from AliExpress and I'm sure I will have some adapter that I can put these surface mount chips into here. So this is an opto coupler tester and it's an IC tester. And basically this tests many, many, many logic chips including 74HC573, which is the one that we have. So that I have coming and we are going to have a little play with that. We can do a review. I have bought it myself. I've not been sent it to review by the way, but I thought it'd be interesting to play with. But that at the moment is saying delivery in about four weeks time, although I ordered it about the 28th of Jan, so maybe it'll turn up a little bit sooner. So is there anything else we can do in the meantime while we don't have the tester? Well, we could actually build a tester. I mean, this is a latch, so it has eight inputs and eight outputs and a couple pins that control it. So we could build something with some dip switches, like the ones we removed from here, and we could clock the data pin and we could read the output. We could make something manual to test them, or we could use like an Arduino and a little program to test them. But since I have a tester coming anyway, I'll show you guys how to do a quick and dirty method of testing these. And that's basically to measure the 
input pins and output pins and diode test mode. It's easier probably if we just tag this down to a little bit of Vero board while I do it because with the two meter probes it's likely to slide around even on the mat. So let me just show you how I would do it. Yeah, this, this is how I would do it, not necessarily the best way to do it, yeah, or the only way to do it, but I'll show you. So we have a little bit of strip board, Vero board, and the first thing I'm going to do is just tag the chip on the end of it to keep it still. Yeah, I can just fit it on surround this top end. I only need to connect one pin to it anyway. And that's the ground pin. So let's just get a bit of uh, solder on here. Okay, and we'll stick our chip on. I have to turn it round, looking at the best angle at it. There. So I now have the chip tagged down by one pin. Just shine the torch on it so you can see it's only the one pin that's actually attached here. Yeah. You don't have to do this, but this will help to keep it still, I assure you. So now we get the test meter and we go into diode mode. Okay, so we're in diode mode. And what I'm going to do is connect the red lead to the ground terminal. So this is like reversed polarity. Because most of these types of chips will have an input protection circuit, which is a reverse bias diode from all the inputs to power or ground. And we should be able to see those diodes. And if the chip is blown or burnt out, the chances are they've been damaged. This is a bit of a quick and dirty test. It's not 100% accurate. It will not tell you the function of the chip is okay, but it will probably tell you if you have any shorts or damaged inputs or outputs. So we'll connect onto ground there and then we'll just go to the various pins. Okay, and what we're looking for is effectively like a diode junction, we want them all to be the same. Okay, so 672, 672, 672, 671, you see why I've tagged it down? Just makes it easier. 670, I mean these are close enough, yeah. 670. 671. We do have a connection, 671. 671. And pin one, yes, it does 670, okay. And then the same with the side. Now this is the power pin, so this may well read differently. Yeah. Let's have a look. Careful when you do this, by the way, you don't actually break the pin off the chip. Yeah, you have to. What I suggest we probably do is just clip this on with a, uh, a crock clip lead. Actually, I can just keep my finger on this chip to hold it straight, basically. So I'll just uh, effectively just tag that on there. Okay, we have continuity. Now I can just keep my finger on this and it'll stay still. Okay. So six, seven, one, six, one, six. That means slightly different. Now we can compare that with one of the other ones. If they all read the same, the chances are it's okay. Six, one, six. These may be outputs rather than inputs, maybe. Okay, they're all reading the same up this side, but different from the other side. Okay. Last one, and then that's the power pin which reads different again. So we know how that one reads and we can now compare all the other ones and see if they're the same. So I'll just work through these and tell you if I find anything different. Well, they all read the same guys. So I think we can say, unless we're unlucky, these are, chips are good. They're certainly not blown as such, if you know what I mean. So for now, I'm gonna put them back on and let the guy try this. We can always, test them again when the, the chip tester arrives. These I'm just going to put them back on with a soldering iron. These shouldn't be too difficult to do. I'm not going to use hot air to solder them. Again guys, this is my way. I'm not necessarily saying this is the best way, but this is the way that I do it. I can, and I can only show you the way I do it. Yeah. So we'll just get this chip to line up onto the pads. They're nice and flat. We'll tag a couple of pins down or at least one. I would put a little bit of flux to do this, it will help. So we'll go with this corner. 
just because it's the easiest one to get at basically put a bit of solder on the soldering iron and we just come out and we'll just come it in onto the one pin and hopefully that will solder down a bit of pressure on the chip okay so that is basically in place I can move it slightly okay and we can just tag the other end or the opposite corner whichever we fancy I'm doing this without any magnification by the way a bit more solder on there okay it's not tagging on so a little bit of flux is what we need and now it should go just fine okay and then the rest of them are easy to do I'll just put flux down here and I'll do the rest of the pins you'll see once again I'm using the BC3 tip this one the chunky one I find it's ideal for everything really okay without magnification we'll try it yeah Looks a bit awkward to get down there because of this resonator, but I've done it, I think. Okay, solder bridge, not a problem. If you're struggling, remove the thing that's causing you the obstruction, yeah. Put it back on afterwards. Just push that resistor slightly out of the way. Resistor network. Again, remember I'm doing this without the magnification, guys. Just so you guys can see easier what I'm doing. Okay. But we have it. Yeah. So I'll just get under the microscope and do the rest of them. It's a bit easier for me. And then we can put the microcontroller back on. They are all replaced then. You can see, nicely soldered. The only thing I did manage to melt was a switch, which I did comment on. And actual fact, it's still working. But I'd have spare ones. It does, it does actually push in and out. I can flip clicking. We can test it most likely. So just from one side to the other. Well, that's a short. Right this way. Yeah, so the switch is actually working. But I do have those. Just the processor then, which is exactly the same technique as these. Just four sides rather than two, but no difference. Uh, the capacitors and this little thing, anything else. Yeah, the switches. The little header pin header the processor the EEPROM capacitors the other things came from something else we're already in here so this one just like the other things and as i noted it came off that way with the label towards this corner an actual fact there is like a rounded corner there i'm just looking at the symbol on here uh and possibly there's a rounded corner on the chip there as well yeah, in fact, we can actually see now the chamfered corner is there and the labels where we said it was. So this is the same sort of thing. It's just a matter of getting it into position or very close to. Like so, I think I'm just getting this side lined up that way slightly. Okay, once we pin one corner down, we can always move it a little bit if we need to just to straighten this up the flux in here you can see some of this damage i was talking about but these all test okay hopefully there's a little bit of solder left on the end yeah enough to get those two pins down so that'll stay in place now we can just make sure yeah it's all lined up quite nicely 
So we'll just start from the other side somewhere as Mr. Guru, thank you, pointed out. Don't come back from the starting from the corner there where you were. Uh, you've tagged it down so it might come loose when you don't want it to. Okay. So I'll start from this end instead. Okay. There's a couple of corners tagged now, so it's not going to go anywhere. Right. I'll say if you get solder bridges like that, don't worry about them. Just brush them back off again. Use the excess to go onto a different pin. If it's not working for you, put a bit more flux there. If it's still not working for you, warm the area up with the hot air and then do it. As a final resort, you can try some prepared, yeah. Okay. You see the foot's made all the difference. So that looks nice as shoulders, turn it around. Look guys, you do not need a fine soldering tip to do this. In fact, it may make it harder because you may not get the heating that you require. Okay. Again, if you're just struggling to get it flow, a little bit more flux. Come again. Too much. Okay, it happens. I use that excess solder to put on the other pins. Yeah, see. Find a use for it. Okay, two more sides. I'm now coming over the top of the transformer, a little bit awkward because the different angle I need to hold the soldering iron up, but I think we should do it. No, that's not easy. There's a large power transformer on this PCB, you probably saw it earlier. So it's making it difficult to get the soldering iron at the angle I want it. Okay. If you're not sure you have a connection, you can always just use your multimeter and just make sure you have. I'm just going to add a little bit more flux again. Usually you can see very clearly that you've got a good solder joint. Again, solder bridge. Okay. That was all that. Right this side will be much easier without the obstruction. You see, I can hold the tip at the angle I want it now. And that bit of solder on there is just going exactly where I want it to. Okay, guys. Last solder bridge. Okay. I think I see one more. In there. Okay, let's have a look. That looks good. So really all we managed to do was prove what isn't wrong with this. We now know that this what's working, we obviously don't know if the process is actually working or not. 
The other thing I could try is to remove the EEPROM chip. This is an EEPROM from one of the good ones. I feel let me have one back just to do that. And we can compare the contents with this. If they're different, we can save this one and copy the other one into it. Uh, we could try to replace this chip, another 7400 Logic chip. We'll test it when the tester arrives. But really now, given the fact we tested a lot of the things on this board when it was here previously, the bug in the ointment is this one. We can't do anything with it. If it's faulty, it's faulty and there's nothing we can do. So I will give him this back just to see that if doing that, resoldering everything effectively did help. I don't particularly hold out much hope it will make any difference. But for now, that's probably as much as we can do. But having said that, I think we talked about some interesting techniques, some of the other ways you would go about working on this sort of board when you're faced with this sort of problem. And I hope you guys enjoyed that. And I hope you guys have got things to say about it. Yeah. So uh, get commenting and I will see you all soon on another Learning Electronics Repair video. Ciao for now, guys.